Psalm 36 is a wonderful little hymn in book one that focuses on the vastness and the greatness of God and his character. As we try to measure the character and the nature of God in human terms, it is beyond our ability to do so. And uh, this psalm uh, speaks to that aspect of it. It begins in a rather unusual way. It begins with a focus on a wicked person uh, in these first four verses, but then it moves into this uh, majestic hymn before returning back to its original theme. It's classified as a hymn or as a song of trust, and we don't have any idea what the occasion was for it. As you see, the psalm begins with uh, a description of uh, a wicked person. The very first verse gives us a translation difficulty. The ESV says, transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart, uh, suggesting that, uh, that, that that temptation to sin um, is deep and it speaks to us, it compels us, it calls to us in a very persuasive way. That's one way of translating it. Uh, the NIV takes a little different tack with it. Uh, and it says, I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked, or older translations will say an oracle, and that is simply a revelation, an insight, or a word from God. And so it could be that that's how the psalm is beginning. God told me this about the wicked, in other words. And uh, we see uh, as well that this uh, this temptation to sin comes from the heart or is, is deep in the heart, uh, even as the, uh, the footnote there says as well, uh, that uh, temptation uh, is, as uh, James says, that we're drawn away, uh, we're drawn by our desires that dwell within us. And a key here, and this is not only in this psalm, but also Psalms 14, 53, that, that speak about the fool in particular who says there's no God, uh, doesn't have any fear of God, doesn't respect God, doesn't worship God. Uh, that's often what fear uh, means in the psalms is a reverence or respect or honor. So there's no recognition of God before him. And Paul will quote this verse and many others in Romans 3 as he uh, describes this, this human nature that we have of, of all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's essentially the conclusion Paul comes to, and he quotes this psalm and, and several other psalms in that text in Romans chapter 3. And the root of that sin is found in verse 2. He flatters himself with his own eyes. In other words, pride. Pride is the, is the, is the central sin. It's the root of all sin. In, an, in this particular case, uh, it's an, it says his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. So his pride is that no one will ever know. I'm going to get away with this. I'm so powerful uh, that I can do this wicked thing and no one will ever know. Understand, that is, that's a lie. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Uh, no one will ever know because God will know. Uh, God sees all, God knows all, and there are consequences for everything that we do. Sin is never done in isolation. It always affects other people, and ultimately it will come to light. Jesus says this, that everything in all creation uh, is laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And a pride is the, is the root of all sin. Uh, the word narcissism comes to mind here of someone who flatters himself, who, who thinks of themselves first and foremost, uh, and uh, narcissism, the word itself comes from Narcissus, the son of the river god who fell in love with his own reflection in the water and couldn't look away. Uh, and that was such a, a strong appeal to him that he died there looking at his reflection, so self-absorbed that he couldn't look away. Well, that's the de depiction here of uh, the wicked person. They flatter themselves in their own eyes. They think that they can do no wrong and they will never be found out for anything that they do that it's wrong. Uh, their words are troubled, deceitful. He ceased to act wisely and do good. So foolishness has been embraced. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. So a lot of descriptors there of, uh, of, of, of a wicked, godless person. Uh, the picture of plotting trouble on his bed suggests that, that it never stops, that whether waking or sleeping, he's, uh, he's always thinking uh, about doing what is evil, doing what is wrong. So when he's not acting on sin, he is, he is thinking about it. Uh, so we have here in the first four verses the, 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 the character of a person who has no fear of God, uh, and uh, you see the, the expansiveness um, of the way that's described, uh, that it, it is an all-encompassing way of life. When you reject the knowledge and the fear and the worship of God, 
uh, this this then becomes a worldview, a way of looking at everything that's contrary to God. Now, in contrast to that, the middle part of the psalm is a hymn of praise to God, beginning with God's steadfast love. Your chesed is the Hebrew word. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. So the heavens would be the highest uh, places uh, where the sun, the moon, the stars, and in fact, even God himself dwelt in the, the highest of the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. The clouds are a little closer. So we're talking about the sky here or the firmament. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Mountains are a typical uh, metaphor for the firmness or steadfastness or the unchanging, eternal nature of God. That's a frequent metaphor. Psalm 90 suggests that. Your judgments are like the great deep. So we're talking here about the depths of the oceans uh, that are uh, unknowable, unsearchable. They are vast. Indeed, as you go out in a, in a ship, you can only look down a few feet before it becomes so murky that you can't see beyond that. And so that's the idea. God's judgments are beyond knowing, beyond searching out. And so you have here uh, a, a picture in these two verses of four primary attributes of God himself and how every one of these are without measure. They're vast. They're beyond comprehension. Uh, whether and this really is portrayed in a vertical dimension. We start from the top to the heavens and then down to the depths of the sea. So this is uh, every uh, place where 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 what humans experience on the on the planet Earth, uh, uh, water, earth, and sky would be the three elements that are primarily referred to in the Psalms, and every one of those offer um, a measure that falls short of uh, the, the love, the faithfulness, the righteousness, and the judgments of God. This same idea is echoed in Ephesians 3 when Paul prays for the Ephesians, prays for us, that we might have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, long, high, and deep is the love of Christ, to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. And so Paul uh, would show us that this as well is not uh, is a description of of the love of Christ that that this love of God that David is describing here in around 1000 BC is is fully manifest in the cross in Jesus when we fully uh, can begin to see the full extent of God's love for humanity. Uh, I love the fact that the first four verses, uh, which are, are so dark and and uh, uh, and dramatic in their picture of the consequences of evil, and yet immediately following them are these two verses that point us ultimately, I think, to the cross and to the magnitude of the love of Christ. Man and beast, you save. That God expresses his love, his faithfulness, his righteousness, his justice, all of this is expressed towards us as salvation. How precious is your steadfast love. There is again, O Lord, uh, the children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. The phrase, the shadow of your wings, is a frequent metaphor in the Psalms of, of how a bird would protect its young. It also has overtones of the cherubim that were on the Ark of the Covenant in the temple, uh, that this is where God dwelt on earth. And so we can take refuge in God's presence on earth in his temple. Some would make that case because the very next line mentions the house, God's house, which was also a, a frequent metaphor for the temple. So it might have a double meaning here, both the typical one of a, the, the shadow of the wings of a bird as a metaphor, but also uh, God's presence on earth, God coming to earth and dwelling in a, in a house where we can meet with him. It could be that verse 8 also is just taking us back to Psalm 23, which uh, David said uh, uh, that uh, I will dwell in your house forever. That uh, Psalm 23 speaks of God's provision, preparing a table before me, filling my cup. Um, so it could be that that is referred to as well, that, that God is a source of abundance. Uh, you give them drink from the river of your delights, with you as the fountain of life. So safe drinking water came from uh, running rivers or from springs, uh, not uh, stagnant water, but fresh, abundant water, clean water, safe water. And in your light, do we see light? Now, it's not too hard to see that, that these metaphors here of abundance in a house, of drinking from the river, of light, uh, that these are all picked up by Jesus, particularly in the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world, I am the bread of life, I am the water of of life. And so again, we see this psalm ultimately points us to Jesus 
and uh, the the goodness of God expressed in uh, human form. The final verses of the psalm take us back to the psalmist's initial complaint, in a sense. He says, continue your steadfast love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart, connecting those two from the previous uh, stanza. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. So this is reference back to the the, the one who flatters himself in verse 2, um, the wicked in verse 1. So David must be experiencing some kind of Mm, uh, trial as a result of the wicked uh, persons in his life. And so it's a prayer against them, recalling those verses. And there the evildoers lie fallen, they are thrust down, unable to rise. This then is the, the final word of confidence. David is confident that uh, that uh, while the wicked uh, may be plotting on their beds and they never, never stop thinking about how they can do evil, uh, the ultimate truth is that they will lie fallen. They will sleep for good. They will be unable to to rise. Uh, Let the psalm encourage you that when you see evil in our world and when you uh, feel like there's there's nothing but narcissists, nothing but arrogant people who have no regard for God, um, understand that right in the midst of it is the cross, just as uh, the love and faithfulness and justice of God all show up in verses 5 and 6, right in the heart of this psalm. Uh, So God showed up in Jesus uh, right in the heart of of the world and the heart of time to demonstrate and to embody uh, the steadfast, um, unsearchable, vast, steadfast love of God. May you know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ.